This lecture is about composition, two-dimensional composition primarily. I might make a few comments about three-dimensional work, but on the whole, this is about two-dimensional surface, and you're looking at a two-dimensional surface, a screen. So try to think about your screen also as a surface for artwork and design. So balance is really important when dealing with composition is primarily uh, the one component that you have to achieve. And there's two kinds. This is an illustration of symmetrical balance. Symmetrical balance means that there's like sized elements on either side of an axis. So an axis might be going vertical through the composition or horizontally, but this one would be vertical and like sized elements, shapes, if you want to call them, I call them elements, components, like sized elements. They don't have to be exactly the same. I made them exactly the same, but they can be different shapes, but like sized elements on either side of the axis is symmetrical balance. It creates equal weight, which will give you balance. Here are some illustrations from the time periods, different time periods. Um, that have and use symmetrical balance. So this one is from the late 1800s, the 19th century, around the end of the 1800s. It's in the arts and crafts movement, and it is a book cover or an actual inside page. So you can see that if I pull a vertical axis, that on either side of that vertical axis, or even a horizontal one, there are like-sized elements on either side of it. So it's symmetrical balance. This one also from the mid 20th century also is symmetrical. Again, if you pull an axis, there's like-sized elements. Even though this is black and larger, you have red elements that are larger also on either side of this vertical axis. If I pull it horizontally, again, there's like-sized elements on either side of the axis. This one in the uh, 21st century, kind of influenced from Middle Eastern culture. Um, also, again, if I pull a vertical axis or a horizontal one, you will have like-sized elements. This one's in the spirit of maximalism, more is more. Um, and patterning is also dominant, but regardless of those other design elements, the shapes are equal in size. Then we have asymmetrical balance. There are two types of balance in symmetrical or asymmetrical. So when you pull the axis, they are, they are unlike, they are they are different sized elements or components on either side of the axis, different sized, but because of negative space, the space around positive elements, the positive elements being the black elements, the space around it, the space around here, the space around this, that space has visual weight. You feel something in it. And when you add the smaller element, size, the smaller sized element with the negative space, it equals equal weight when you're comparing it on the other side of the axis, right? So asymmetrical balance is different sized objects and the negative space is really important to be included. So we have, again, through the years, uh, early 20th century work. This is a very, very important work, a seminal work in graphic design history by Lucien Berhard. It's called Object Poster. But again, you have the, the, the negative space here is really, really important to help create the weight. This is slightly asymmetrical, but this weight is very important to kind of create um, the balanced component. Even the matchsticks could be a little bit shorter, but overall this negative space with the matchsticks helps to create a balanced composition. Um, I'll also talk about this one, which is another example of lots more is more. It's in the middle of the 80s, 1980s a little bit later in the 20th century. So maximalism or kind of punk aesthetic has already started to develop. Uh, but you can still see that there's dominant elements. Uh, they're black, they're large, they're grouped. I'll talk about grouping in a little bit. But if you pull the axis, there are different sizes, different sizes. These are larger. 
These are smaller, but the negative space in here helps to create the balance. Even this negative space helps to create the balance with these elements up here. And then lastly, in the 21st century, when you have a photographic element that takes up the whole space, it's implied space, it's going off the page, right? Even this is going off the page. Even the black is going off the page, right? So that's called imp implied space. Um, the You have to also analyze the photographic composition along with the elements that are on top of it. So your body copy here is black and has a lot of mass. This is a large piece of type. It's a headline. These are smaller, but this is bolder. So all of these elements are grouped together. They have a weight to them. And how are they balanced? They're balanced with all of this negative space that's up here at the top. And even a little bit of this black um, compositional element up here in the photograph. So you have to analyze the space, the negative space, compared to the positive space. So again, different sized objects across a horizontal axis creates the asymmetrical balance. Uh, a, a variety of things, we talked about this uh, before in class, but you can have different, different elements. Some of them are harder to see than others, right? So this is slightly asymmetrical. You have some larger elements at the top, a little bit smaller elements at the bottom, but also you have some negative space and a darker. So this is where color comes into play. So this is slightly asymmetrical. This is slightly asymmetrical because of the dominant of the black element up here. If this was not here, then it would be a symmetrical composition. But including the brand mark or the logo of the theater is very important. They decided to rotate it and it creates just a little bit more of a of this this shaped element on the right side which is um, also balanced by this darker larger element on the left side these two below are symmetrical this one is not completely exactly the same it's slightly different but it's pretty damn close to being exactly the same sized elements on either side of the axis and then this one's a little tricky but if you pull the horizontal element, I'm sorry, the vertical element or the horizontal one, uh, similar sized objects across the axis, including the negative space, right? So, um, yeah, including the negative space. So when you pull it vertically, similar sized objects. When you pull it horizontally across the chin or the mouth, these elements are similar in size than what's happening down here. This one's asymmetry again. Uh, if I pull the axis, we have different sized elements across the axis. Uh, but they're balanced because you have a larger element up here and you have the negative space in your type, which is grouped. This kind of becomes a polygon and this helps to uh, create balance with the heaviness that's happening up here. Also weighted down here, large, large, but different here. Then you have all these metric rhythmic uh, shapes here. So there's are there are different shapes, different size shapes across the horizontal axis. And if I pull it vertically, there are different shapes also. Something uh, larger as juxtaposed to nothing. Similar shi size shapes, but more of them on this side of the axis than that side. So again, balance is really hard, but it's very, very important to be analytical about it. And you analyze the size of things and the space around them. This is an asymmetrical architectural building. I put it in there because it is three-dimensional, though we're looking at it in a two-dimensional surface, but three-dimensionality can also be asymmetrical, right? So if this was your house, uh, this negative space up here helps to balance the composition of the design of the architecture. Now, again, this is a photograph and they deliberately took this photograph straight on. So this is an asymmetrical photograph design of the house. Uh, but I'm also going to argue that the house design is asymmetrical. So the architect wanted more negative space up here to balance the tallness of this side of the house. 
This is bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry, I bring it up. It's a little kitschy, but bilateral symmetry uh, is exactly the same image on both sides of the act. It's a mirror image. Sometimes it can be useful. Other times it can just be pop culture, uh, but it is something that you should know about. Now I'm going to talk about building a composition and how you can do it using certain uh, structure. So I left this text in here. If you want, you can stop this video and read it. But overall, I'll kind of summarize each one. So one thing that you can do is create structure by proportion, right? So you use some type of a grid. This is a nine box grid, three over three, which creates nine squares. And then we see one, one uh, element as a unit, and then two of them are two units, and then three of them are three units together. And if you approach a layout or the design of a composition, you can use proportion to create a balanced composition. So if I have something that wants to take up three elements or three units, that's going to be larger versus one. But if you put them in the same composition, they will be in proportion because you're using math and that will create a balanced composition initially, depending also on where you place them in the cells. So we also have something called grouping. How you group things together matters. Like-minded um, information should be grouped together. <clears throat> That will be helpful for deciphering communication. But in this simple exercise, this is just to show you one element can be larger. It's in proportion if you put these two grouped together. It's the design department from Ringling School of Art and Design. That's in this two units. It's in proportion to the third, this first one. And then these thir this third one, which is in one unit, all of them are grouped together. So as you kind of look, you see kind of this triangular uh, approach, but you don't necessarily read it from top to bottom. You read this first, then this, maybe this or this. And then these little pattern dots down here, one's darker. You could have one, you could leave this um, as negative space, negate of these other dots if you want. But how to what, what size to make the dots? Well, this one unit is divided into four proportionally, and then you can decide to put it here, 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 or here. So just to show you the concept of using proportion in your design layout to help create balance. Then you need to think about grouping. I just brought it up a little bit before but I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So this example up top is no grouping. So things are just kind of scattered all over the place. It still has the nine over nine, and they're still kind of using proportion here. So that's a good start. But you still have to think about how you're going to group information together to, again, help your brain decipher the communication, either linguistically or visually, right? So here you have to take in consideration all the negative space. These are all the little bits of negative space in the red outlined boxes. And here is the design without it. Well, it kind of has this lots of movement, a little chaotic structure here. Maybe your one emphasized element pops out because there's more space and it's different shape than the others, but there is this constant movement around, which can be chaotic and harder for your brain to see things. The better choice is to think about grouping, like-minded or liked things grouped together to create a, it's still an active composition. There still is a nice movement around the page, but it's just not so chaotic, right? So you have some things grouped here in the one unit, you have some things grouped here in the two, and then you have the three unit element um, here and one dot. So if I bring you back to this composition, this is, this is okay composition. It's just not as interesting as if we took those elements and designed it such as this one here. This is a much more interesting composition because there's more negative space at the bottom. It's not so bottom heavy. And, the, and it kind of goes in a circular fashion, your eye movement. So grouping and being uh, you know cognitive of your negative space and how you're grouping your negative space also. It's not little bits and pieces. 
is also something you should think about. Then we want to talk about alignment or using the edges. So here's an example of using edges. This composition, it's again the same amount of elements, same size of elements as previously said, but now we have to think about how do we create interesting dynamic connections, tension, uh, touching of things, right? To make it an active composition, even more. Um, so you can have things touch the edge. Again, I mentioned implied space before. Things go off the edges, touch the edges, and sometimes they go off, which makes it very interesting. We can't see what's over here, but we there's more information implied. Um, but if you only put things on two edges, it's okay. You know, it has a very strong horizontal uh, focus, and maybe that is very important to you and you're trying to communicate something about the horizon or calmness or, or just steadiness, uh, and that might work. But if you actually do activate some edges here, you get more of a circular motion, a more triangular active composition. So instead of using this negative space, which creates more calmness up here, if you touch it, then it actually creates more activity. Same with the negative space down here. It's calming you because this is all contained in the center. If you pull it down, it creates more activity, right? So how you activate a composition, you can use the edges deliberately or in a more calm way, right? You can do the same thing if this was just all verticality. The other thing you want to do is if you don't want to use the edges, you can use, you can create alignment in inside the composition, right? So here's a composition that's similar to the first one that I showed you, but just flipped, right? Um, and all the edges here on the left side are activated. This negative space you would think could balance this, but it seems a little top heavy, a little heavy on the left hand side. There's not enough negative space to balance it. Plus, it's not as active or interesting because all the focus is over here. So you could change the alignment if you want and make it inside, and then you have different elements aligned with each other and it creates a strong central focused composition, uh, which is quite nice, uh, created with a pop of emphasis at the top with the circle. So depending on how you use the edges, how you create alignment can also create a more interesting composition. It creates meaning, meaning perhaps more calmness or more activity. Uh, more central focus. So you have to kind of decide as a designer, what are you trying to say? And then you, you use layout and composition to reinforce your meaning. I talked about grouping, right? So again, here are some non-grouped elements. My brain has to decipher each one of these separately. When you group things together, it makes it easier for people to understand information and to create a flow or visual hierarchy. Visual hierarchy is what you see first, second, and third. You're guiding the viewer to a more, um, I would say, controlled communication. Down here, you can group similar elements together uh, and create kind of a dominant shape here with an emphasis point. You can also flip it and create the emphasis point right here instead of down here, right? So how you group elements creates different shapes, different mass, different focus. Uh, but the most important thing about grouping is why are you grouping? How are you grouping? And why are you grouping? Those three questions you should always ask yourself when you create a composition. How are you grouping? Why are you grouping? And what are you grouping? Does it make sense? Does it logically make sense to group things? Now we'll talk about how to divide space. So the first one is the easiest one. It's called the law of thirds. You take a composition. This happens to be a square. It doesn't have to be a square. It can be a circle. It could be a, a polygon. It can be a, um, a, a horizontal or a rectilinear shape. Um, you divide it into thirds, right? So when you do that, 
you create a center focus in the composition where you have four points where emphasis can take place, right? So here I give you three, or the book actually gives you three compositions uh, using that formula, right? So this information is important here and it's emphasized also with this kind of uh, period circle dot, but this is really important information that will take place right in the center. This also is a similar idea. You're kind of rotating some things, being a little bit more active, maybe a little bit more avant-garde, um, kind of changing orientation to, ha to create a little bit more abstraction. Uh, but still, the important information takes place here, and maybe the most important information takes place at your dot. You can rotate the whole thing, and again, if you notice down here, they touch if this was floating and there was a little negative space there, that would not work as well. We need to pull that down, all of this information, to pull it down, to have it touch, uh, to create kind of a stability point. But again, all of this information here is the most important with the most important point right there. So again, the law of thirds is equally divided cells. Um, and I'll show you a grid later, which has more cells, but if you just use the law of thirds, you'll get kind of a central focus of four points that you can play with. Here's a composition. This is actually the painting by Monet. And again, we close our eyes, open our eyes, and we go right here. So when the painter was trying to come up with a composition, they knew by using the law of thirds, dividing this, um, that whatever was going to be really important needed to be right here. Now you might say, oh, well, that's kind of the center of the composition, but where exactly in the center, right? So we also can take two diagonals, crisscross, and this becomes the ultimate point in the center. How do you know that? You know it because you're using math and rulers, but also What's nice is this beautiful river that is so pretty goes through the two important points in the composition of the rule of thirds and the center of the boat does too. So that's why this is a really nice balanced composition. It is asymmetrical, but it has a lot of interesting points in the composition. So again, the rule of thirds is a great way to divide space. Then you have something called rebatement. And that is using squares, overlapping squares that create overlapping shapes that then can be used as your emphasis points or emphasis space. So here, if you close your eyes and open them, you're going to think that, again, it's in the center, but why and how did it get there? So rebatement, again, this is a slightly horizontal structure, composition, or shape right? And you have it right here. And then you do a left rebatement, which is a left square. It's using the perfect square concept. You do a left, you do a right, they overlap. It gives you this space here that you know in your composition, it's supposed to take place. And again, if you draw, when you draw the diagonal lines using the squares that you created, you get this beautiful diamond point that gives you uh, the perfect space for like where the head goes, the butt, the tail, the head of the horse, the bottom of the horse. So it gives you a nice way to kind of create that structural space for drawing that horse. You can do it vertically too. It's a little bit more, depending on the size of your format, if you know, if we did it here, it, again, it kind of brings you right into that diamond space. Um, there. That doesn't mean that you can't have interesting elements that are happening on the outside of the rebatement, but they're not the primary focus, right? And again, if you look at this, you have um, different sized elements, slightly asymmetrical, different size elements on the axes. So rebatement is a good place to start also, because again, we're analyzing these compositions. They already exist. We're breaking them down. But as a designer or an artist, you're going to be hit with the blank page. So sometimes creating these structures ahead of time will help you figure out where to place things. 
Then we have the golden section. It usually depends on a lot of analysis of nature. Lots and lots of natural objects have this type of golden section, golden uh, ratio type of propor proportion. It's based on proportion and division of space and spiral rhythm, right? So everything goes in arcs into an emphasis point and they diminish mathematically into uh, each other, but all of these elements are perfectly in proportion with one another. And if you create them on the spiral, you will end up with a balanced composition. Again, an asymmetrical balanced composition, but still one that works. Then you get into complexity. I'm not going to take too much time for this, but I just want to show you it's this composition here. This is an etching. And how would you decide where to place the bull and then the shadow and the pole and the bullfighter kind of jumping over the bull? There's a lot of horizontality in the background, the steps, and then you have this kind of group this crowd over on the left hand side and negative space on the right but the action is happening here and how do you know where to place it if it's just slightly off it's going to create an unbalanced composition so we can analyze it as again it's a horizontal you can actually go ahead and draw a diagonal you could draw the other diagonal too and see where the intersection point is this person just drew the diagonal and then put a golden ratio right here. And if you notice, it spirals right into the head point, right? So if you use these tactics, um, they're really great to help you figure out where to place things, right? So here's the intersection point, which is the negative space, the tension between the foot and the bull. It's really a nice negative space that creates kind of a grouping between these two things. The verticality also uh, creates um, a nice alignment with, with the, I would say, the rebatement that's happening in here. So there's lots of complexity happening, but I want to share with you that you can place golden sections on top of your um, composition in smaller ratios uh, just to start with and see where it goes. I'm going to use the same composition, just dealing with the grid structure, right? So I mentioned grid before. This is where you take a composition, a horizontal rectangle here, and this is one, two, three, four, five, six vertical lines, and one, two, three, four, five, six horizontal lines, equal amount, boom, and you have all of these equal units, right? So it's not three over three, it's six over six. You could do seven over seven, four over four, whatever you want. Um, but it creates different cells that then help to structure the space. And if you see, again, this pole is right on one of the grid lines. Um, the bull's head also is, the bull takes up two units, the man takes up one in almost a half. So you can use the grid structure to help you decide how big things should be, where they should end and begin. Even the crowd is one, two, in almost a half, two and a half units uh, horizontally and one unit vertically, right? And then you have one, two, and a fourth or a third maybe of the actual background. So it really helps to kind of structure uh, structurally create proportion in your composition. So that's the grid. And again, the grid with the two diagonal lines. Again, the first thing you can do with space is just drag or draw two diagonal lines to create where that structure is going to start happening. And then if you notice, you can start pulling grid lines to help create the grid of your dreams that will help to create the proportion. All right, so I'm going to finish up with just describing what the grid is. It's a really old, uh, ancient actually, but it's an organizing element that actually came out in the 20th century in graphic design. It's a theory and a practice. It's a quote unquote design invention. And it was used, it's big heyday was in the 1940s and 50s with Swiss design or the typographic international style. Every buddy around the world uh, used the grid system coming out of after World War II when the whole world was in chaos and we needed 
structure. So sometimes the things are developed as theories and practice based on world events, and that's how history impacts art and design. So as I said, it's an ancient structure. It's an ancient type of thinking. It brings clarity, efficiency, economy. Those are the types of things that are associated with it. It impugns meaning into your designs if you use a heavily gridded structure. As I said, it's very ancient. Greeks, Roman, Incas, and Japanese have used it. And many of you maybe have intersected with cities that use the grid structure. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution and in the Enlightenment period, right, we're, we're coming out of like the mid uh, 18th century, moving into the 19th century. And again, there was an enormous shift that happened moving away from land into the cities toward machine learning or machine uh, mechanization, the Industrial Revolution. So order also was desired and rationalism was accepted. So these things in history create events in art and design that kind of get people thinking, right? And then you might say, well, where are we now? Well, the grid still has a lot of dominance, but sometimes there's a lot of breaking the rules. Um, just to go over different structures of the grid, you can have units for text, units for rules, units for pictures. Something can be dark. Something can be larger and dark, but it has to be balanced with other things. Lots of negative space can uh, be around something dark and smaller, but then there can be other elements that are grouped together to balance it out. So balance is still a part of everything, uh, even when you're using the grid. You can't bunch everything together uh, and think that it's going to constantly just be balanced. You have to be cognizant of the negative space around it. Just to let you know, the simpler the grid is, one, two, or three columns, the harder it is to do layout. You have less experimentation happening. The more complex the grid, uh, the more experimentation can happen and the easier it is to make relationships. Sometimes you have limitations and you have to work within them. And sometimes you can really be bold and do lots of crazy stuff. As I said, the grid is old. You have a hand-drawn or a hand-done ledger, but still you're making alignments. You're grouping things together. Uh, you have headers. You know, here's the, the most important element, and then all these things are kind of linearly, vertically, and horizontally gridded out, making sense, and grouped together. And then you have an, an invoice here that does the same thing, but it uses digital technology to do it. But the same concepts are being created over and over again. You have a title, you have grouped information, you have alignment happening, right? So things are not so chaotic. You have to make things clear, certainly in business communications. Grids are everywhere on the web. You have uh, interface design that uses gridding. And so that you can understand where you are and where you're going in your computer systems. How you can shop has to be gridded out so you understand what you're buying. And even if you're using a symmetrical design, things can be hierarchical. This takes more precedence, but again, you're kind of moving down the page, right? Grid system is an aid. It's not a guarantee. You still have to kind of permit lots of uses to have it happen. It's a personal style. I'm going to, you know, we'll talk about more complex ones or less simple, or like simple ones. The big thing you can do is to learn and know about the grid and then practice it. So there's, I'm going to just highlight four simple grids, right? Manuscript grid, it's mostly one column. Uh, the column is, this is an asymmetrical you know, design where you have this margin is a little bit larger than that margin, but the negative space uh, inside is balanced. Um, but you, you have limitations, right? Here's a nicely designed book, but the text goes here, the headers go here, and there's negative space. There's, so each page when you turn in this book is going to be pretty constricted to this design. So manuscript grid kind of creates a calm, easy to read environment. You see it a lot in book design sometimes. Again, quick information needs to be absorbed. Manuscript grid. 
column grid. It can be two, three, four, however many. They don't have to be the same. They can be different columns. This is probably a three column grid, but then two uh, are combined together and one is separate. So that's asymmetrical. This is symmetrical. You can do some funky things, you know, different scaled items taking up one column versus two. Um, so you have some experimentation. It's very, very much vertical. It has a lot of verticality. It, it feels very vertical and the layout is very vertical. Um, you see this a lot in page design or magazine design. You're dealing with maybe a lot of information and you have to uh, kind of go through it quickly, but it can be experimental. Hierarchical grid, you see it a lot in visual communication of mobile apps and uh, web design. Usually there's a, a dominant image, you know, that happens on the page. It's kind of front and center. It's the first thing you see, but then you kind of move up to the top where maybe your nav is, and then you move down the page. So the hierarchy is you see maybe an image first or something dominant large, and then you move up to top and go down the page. And then lastly, the modular grid uh, that I mentioned before, everything is gridded out. Things can take up, you know, five over three, but then you have one column of type. You can do, this is very dense. This is a newspaper design. It's used for that. You also can use lots of negative space and little things and large things. So not, so not everything is the same size. It can be very active and very interesting, but everything is in proportion. So if you use the grid, you usually end up with a balanced composition if you play, pay, play atten uh, pay attention, sorry, pay attention to how you're using the negative space. I use the modular grid a lot. It's very contemporary. Here's a contemporary uh, modular grid. It's in, from 1977. It's used by the national parks and it still is today because it's a great utilitarian device. You have, again, it's kind of like a modular grid with a hierarchical grid on top of it. You have a large image and as you go down the page, you can see different elements taking up different cells, but they're all proportionally uh, together. Even one of these cells is little bits of information about this image, two column about this image. So it's a great modular grid that creates visual hierarchy in proportion to create a balanced composition. And then lastly, you can still use a grid system in a very, very contemporary way with diagonals. You still have nice alignment and you group things together and you use, um, you know, I would say rhythm in here, uh, but the axis, if you pull it apart, if you go vertically, you have dissimilar sized elements, but because of the negative space and some color, um, you will still have a balanced composition. This negative space over here helps to balance lots of things that are happening on the other side. Uh, this is pretty complex design. I bring it up only because I want to show you uh, the power of the grid design when you're doing layout design. Don't be afraid of doing things like this and experimenting with it, but you do have to remember grouping, alignment, negative space, right? And you can sometimes see the grid if the designer wants you to, and uh, this one you don't, but you have really interesting large elements balanced by the color differentiation and the negative space. But again, that grouping, the alignment on the edge, or the alignment here with the two and the body text. So it's very modular, you could say, um, but it, it works quite well.